I realize it's been a long day, so I'll try to make it uh, to be a bit of a light entertainment. Let's see. Um, uh, so I'm over the hub. Uh, we met earlier in the week. Thank you. Yeah, can you hear me? Thank you. So I'm Ofer Lahab, uh, here from UCL, from the Astrophysics Group. Um, my research is in observational cosmology, so it would be a bit of a bias in this talk towards uh, this field and also towards uh, some of the work done here at UCL, but I'll try to indicate some other uh, <coughs> interesting work going on uh, all the way from uh, planets to the universe as a whole. Um, so, I mean, no need to explain to this audience the importance of big data, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. By the way, I don't know what what your definitions are, but I like to think that machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. Do you agree with that? It's a matter of terminology, but that's what I think about it. But we decided to keep both um, buzzwords in the title of this school. Um, even so topical. Now, you're here at UCL, and uh, this is one of the eight uh, CDTs funded recently by SDFC. So just to tell you a little bit about what's going on here, um, we have 17 CDT students here at, at UCL, and they come from different departments, primarily from physics, astronomy, and FSSL. Uh, and we have about 20 industry partners, and our students spend some time in a group of three or four students working with some of those partners. I know there are different schemes uh, in other parts, in other CDTs. Altogether, I believe that's a number I got from STFC, 122 PhD students, I think almost all of you are in this school. Maybe not in the room, but in the school. Um, that's great. Also to say, you know, the, the real heroes of any CDT are the students. So the uh, team students, and they are here in the room, uh, and you've met them by now, but also to say that there is this kind of management team, and uh, that's Nikos and myself, as the co-directors of the CDT. Uh, you met the team, uh, Jason, I think, who's not been here yet. Jeremy Yates, deal with the partners. Jonathan Tennyson, who we met, and also Claire Bryce, the the charter training, Sarah Viti, the mission and graduate tutor, and we have the city manager Jamie, who may have met. But I should also mention there are actually 60 academics, 60 potential supervisors from 60 departments. I mentioned two primary departments are physical astronomy and MSSL, uh, space uh, research. But there are actually others, and also, as, as our students can tell you, usually students are supervised by. Uh, two primary and secondary supervisors who come from different departments. Uh, and we also have an advisory board chaired by Charles Lumitz. So I, I should say that really, I think we stopped benefiting from this CDT even before students arrived. Because we started talking to each other in different departments. So it's been a very good influence on the intellectual environment you see. And I'm sure the same is true in the other uh, seven facilities. Okay, what is big data? The good thing about big data, nobody knows what it is. Right? Let's face it, it's a moving target. And uh, I looked up uh, Wikipedia, they say data sets that are so large or complex that traditional, traditional data processing applications are inadequate to deal with them. But what was traditional yesterday or today? Changes, right? What is traditional? Because a new, a new technique to be invented tomorrow might become might become traditional uh, two days later. So it's a moving target, and you probably heard about all this V, volume, velocity, variety. This is another longer list of these volume, variety, velocity, veracity, variability, venue, vocabulary. It's kind of how to sell the concept of uh, big data to the world. Uh, I think it's clear that big data is just a theory. There's no question about that. Uh, I can tell you 
how things have scaled, you know, since the time I was a student of thousands of galaxies and sort of 40 million galaxies in 2DF and now I'm in the RPG survey, 300 million and the future surveys in which many universities here in both the UK and uh, Euclid, DFST, DESI, we're talking all together about billions of folks, so, you know, we just see. And of course, the, the way the uh, storage devices uh, shrink in size and increase in volume and so on. So that's one reason is just we just need to deal with that. But there could also be another point here, which may, may be less emphasized, that we have also to be modest about the capacity of the human brain. Right? As much as we praise the human brain, and still there are th things that a robot cannot do, uh, still the brain has a limitation. So I picked up one illustration, all of you have seen it. So look at that. It's not an animation. It's not an animation. Okay? But oddly enough, it appears differently on my screen and here. So maybe it's not so good. <laughs> I think I can see at the moment. <coughs> okay, it doesn't seem to work here well. No, it does, but that's on my screen. Those dots seem to jump. Could you see it in your do you do you see them jumping? It's not an animation. Yeah. It's just your brain. <coughs> Apparently everybody's brain. Somehow, you know, actually accommodate all 12 points. So we need to talk to a. Uh, we, we need to talk to really to um, brain scientists, neuroscientists to explain that. But to me, it's a very simple illustration. But actually, we have to admit our limitation. And I think it's very encouraging that new algorithms can do better. Uh, so, the, the, what we have, and I'll try really to finish on time, is machine learning and astronomy. And of course, there are now hundreds and thousands of examples. Um, but I've decided to pick up four areas, which I think are uh, quite uh, live, you know, active, and I think they demonstrate what's happening in astronomy. How many here are actually astronomers who define themselves as astronomers? That's interesting. Huh? Majority. Yeah. So you may know most of these things. So I'll try to answer more. It seems to me you are now in the privileged position that you, you, you play with AI and machine learning tools to various projects. And of course, this week, you also know quite a lot, many of you know the infrastructure, but it's connecting the two and maybe seeing the application. So, I'll talk about object classification. That's very <coughs> easy conceptually to understand. Could you tell a star from a galaxy? Then could you take a type of a galaxy? Is it a spiral or elliptical or a subset of that? And then could you classify supernovae? Right, those exploding stars. They come in different forms, 1A, 1B, 1C, type 2. Can you classify them? And also, for instance, patterns of the sky, which are due to gravitational lensing. We'll see, you know, pictures better than a thousand words. One can also look at parameter estimation. You're trying to find a quantity, an example with, with the redshift the galaxy, the distance to the galaxy. And uh, also astrochemistry, some abundances. You can also look at the time domain. And of course, there's crosstalk, so that's why I put supernovae in both. So if you can look at light curve supernovae, you can do the search for planet 9 uh, or other planets and exoplanets, rotational wave, electromagnetic fallout, you have electron Monday on that. And something which I find quite interesting is pushing it beyond just this kind of more traditional machine learning to actually learn some about dynamics. So I'll explain all that. Uh, now, just to put some numbers here, so last time we looked at it, and probably it's changed by now, you can do some homework and tell me if I should update it, but on Google there are about 3.5 billion searches per day. The current population of the world is about 7 billion, it's quite uh, remarkable, right? Um, and LHC, we have colleagues at the LHC here, uh, that's 600 million collisions per second, and they tell me that only 100 per second are interesting. So lots of you know, signal-to-noise issues. 
Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which was one you know, a very important survey still in use, has got about test observations about 200 gigabytes per night. Dark energy survey, which we've been involved here for nearly 15 years, has, can produce on a good night. That's of course it's on cloud, right? And if there's no earthquake. Uh, it's about one terabytes per night. And this would turn into a five sample of 300 million galaxies. We essentially finished observations. LSST, which is built, being built on the next hill, that's 15 terabytes per night, and eventually it'll be about a billion galaxies. Euclid, it's a bit less, but remember it's from space, so it's one of the most challenging projects to actually transmit data from space to Earth at 50 gigabytes per day. But clearly the winner is SKA, it's for a array, it's a radio, a radio array, and they're talking about one petabytes per day. Wow. It's just incredible. Um, not to mention, of course, that these days, in order to have any credible result in any field of science, you need to run simulations. And usually there will be many more simulations than data sets. Right? When we make it meaningful, you want to do a private, say a private you probably need you know, hundreds, thousands of simulations for different parameters. Uh, so I think no question that this is completely overtaking uh, the subject. And that's, I think, why. SDFC was so keen to see how astronomy and high physics could actually have a knowledge transfer to other physics and learn from other physics. It's very much the spirit of the CDT, that's why you're here. This is again, I think you may know most of this stuff, but you can look at in terms of big data science, you can characterize the known. This is so called clustering, unsupervised learning. You can assign new specification supervised learning. Of course, it's cross talk among these things. And you can also discover the unknown, that is to say, you look at some, you do whatever class analysis, but maybe the <coughs> outliers might be more, far more interesting than the main goal. You might get the Nobel Prize for the outlier, not for the main goal. Um, so all that is, is, is fine, and, and uh, uh, you know, these are the benefits, of course, of data sets that you can look at what's typical, what's rare in a physical way. Of course, there are many tools. How many people have used Psyche there by now? That's almost majority. This seems very popular. I know many of our students post play with that, and it can do classification, clustering, regression, dimensionality reduction. And of course, there was a lot of discussion in this recent days on TensorFlow, which also provides similar tools. It's all over. Now, I'll share with you a bit of personal history here. So, I moved from, I, uh, I was born, brought up in Israel, and uh, it so happened I did my CDT in Israeli Air Force. Took the CDT, went to my service, and I dealt with uh, radar systems. And then I came to Cambridge to my PhD, and uh, some years later, I thought, well, it seemed to be crazy. I saw people just looking at Plates and look at, you know, look, finding galaxies and classify them as a look. It's okay for hundreds, thousands, but so I said, why do you do it? Said, oh, well, it's not a big deal, just ask our students to do it. So. <coughs> but then, you, you know, it was clear that it's going to, the data is going to increase dramatically with the advance of CCDs. You know, the original material was photographic plates, and I'll leave you to calculate if you have a billion billion galaxies from LSST, how many each years we need to classify galaxies. It's pretty boring, and I showed you these optical illusions of the eyes, and how do you know if you call the same object if you classify it in the morning or the evening, right? So I got interested in classifying. Okay, this is a paper in science, 1995. Uh, I had a PhD student at the time, Abu Naim, who was died with me, and we actually recruited the six leading gurus of the time. Uh, lots of experience classifying galaxies. The Bockler, you may know the name, Bockler, Bockler profile. Uh, this was actually his last paper with us before he passed away. Um, and some other big names, okay, uh, Vandenberg and so on, and John Buchrau passed away. Um, and they each classified, we gave them a sample of 830 galaxies, they each classified them into 15 possible classes on a particular system. 
and the more or less agreed with the RMS to about two out of the 15. Uh, there are some studies, by the way, in psychology that say that humans can only talk about seven classes. You know, beyond that, it's getting quite confusing. That's why I don't put more than seven bullet points. <coughs> okay? There's something again, I uh, let's appreciate the limitation of human brain. In any case, they classified if like this 15 into RMS of 2, and then we got a, a neural net to see if we can reproduce it, and it did really well. It did really well. So all the numbers are there, and it was a lot of fun. When we put together the CDT to UCL, I got to know Nikos, whom you met, and it turned out that he, in his youth, also did some work in his PhD report on neural nets for tagging bees. So this is the part of physics. So, you know, we were all kind of on the fringes at that time, and for me it's quite amusing to see uh, 30 years, 20, well, it depends how you, when you started, but I would say 20 years, 25 years later, uh, to see all this activity now, so much mainstream, so much money, industry is interested. It's interesting. Uh, but of course, things have move on, and from the traditional neural networks, and you know, my students had to work long time to program it, not just the excitement there, right? that's it, it's there. And they work very hard, but of course there's a new era now, and I myself on a learning curve, I should say on a deep learning curve, on this uh, <laughs> topic of, of deep learning, and uh, I think many of you heard about this, and uh, probably the SI that just covered it. But essentially, if in the past we had to do feature extraction, so I had to take an image of a galaxy, yeah? and decide about 10, 20, 30 parameters using my intuition as an astronomer about the disk ratio, the axial ratio, concentration, and so on. So you do a feature extraction, which admittedly is a lot, but then you put some knowledge there. And then it, you, have, you train, you know all that stuff, right? You train it on a sample, uh, you, and, and then you predict the type. And then I think that the, the field went through some intermediate step of mid-level features, which are a bit more amorphous and more, a bit more uh, objective. And now this state of that is this deep learning where you have all these levels, which I like to think of it as filters. You take the image and, and you have different filters you can work with it, and you get this new information. Um, to some extent, let's be a bit critical. <coughs> okay, so I'm just, I don't like the, the height, I think, oh, let's see. But let's, let's think a bit about it. I still have some respect to the traditional method because I think you put some knowledge into the features. And <coughs> here, it just, there's a risk of it becoming a red box. So I tend to ask people to ask talks and I say at the end, okay, do you understand those features? And most of them say, not really. Right? But I think there's a whole interesting area of interpretation of the network. What features have you extracted? And I think it's also healthy to still run the traditional one as a benchmark. I'd like to know if by using 12 parameters selected by a humble astronomer, one does much worse than the learned. I'd like to know that. And of course, there's this point that it has to do with the amount of data. So this is just uh, some schematic diagram, but there you can quantify it to some performance of some kind, success rate, and so on against the amount of data, up to certain amount of data, the ordinary learning and the deep learning do the same, but then deep learning is going to do much, much better. So this is the revolution, okay? I still remember after we've done all these things in the 90s, five, six years later, people go, oh, neural nets are just out of fashion now. Finish, okay? And then there are other methods, which you know about, okay? decision trees and so on. And now it's all back due to this deep learning. So, this is kind of an introduction. Now, moving, I have to speed up a bit. I have to accelerate, actually, because the universe is accelerating. So, this is the state of dark cosmology. I think most of you know that. And I think the lecture you heard about particle physics. Uh, yesterday, probably also, I've seen the slides. I couldn't be here due to a group event. But um, I think you know the basic story that um, we live in a simple but strange universe. This is by the present composition of the universe, the present, the past was different. And 5% uh, ordinary matter, let's call it 25% dark matter. 
10% dark energy, dark matter and ordinary matter decline with time because the universe is expanding, it's more diluted. Dark energy in simplest form, which is like cosmological constant, is just a constant, but we just happen to be in an era where they're kind of comparable, but maybe in fact three comparable. So this is very interesting. It's another visualization of that and what happened over the past four billion years. Now we're very fortunate we have all these facilities now. I alluded to some of them as the Planck satellite just released results. The, the new results were just announced earlier this week. The Gaia satellite, which produced a sample of 1.5 million stars, which is still only probably 1% of the number of stars in the galaxy. LOFAR, NSK, our radio, dark energy survey, I'll talk a bit more. DESI, I was just on the telephone about DESI last hour. Uh, Euclid space mission, LSST on the ground, but a huge machine. Uh, LSST people refer to this as the movie of the universe. Dark Energy Survey obviously has some, uh, I think in talks like this, it's also nice to share what one has done. <coughs> and we were very lucky when I moved to here from Cambridge in 2004 to run the astrophysics group and to set up cosmology. We were very fortunate to get straight into this project, which is on a mountain in Chile. And part of this camera, which was several tons, was actually constructed in the physics building uh, by my colleagues Peter Dodd and David Brooks. And this was a particular at the time, it looks very revolutionary, of course, now we are near the end of this survey, and now bigger things are being planned. But the idea is to use a multi probe approach to look at counts of galaxies, at weak lensing, large structures, supernovae. But about 300 million galaxies already are already in the bank, and eventually 2,500 supernovae. And um, that's uh, all a very essentially the surveys. The, the planned fires are done, but due to losses to weather, the million and so on, we'll do another season. There are already 160 papers on the archive, and 400, by now, foreign scientists from several countries. Um, Again, I, I showed already LSST, Euclid, just these are DESI, which is another project using spectroscopy. Again, the lenses were assembled in, here in physics, and they're now in the mountain in Arizona. I just got an update about it on a telephone an hour ago, that they're all there safely uh, being assembled. And I mentioned SKA, which is a huge thing, and it's really a scary amount of data. If all what big, big data has gone. In terms of the science, I mentioned it before. This is supernova, which acts as standard candles. So this is the log of the luminosity, again, of flux against redshift. And this is the local Hubble diagram. And this line, which goes so nicely to the points, is aligned with a cosmological constant for dark energy, more generally. But it seems to fit with a cosmological constant. It's 70% of the universe. Why do we need it there? If we don't put it there, the data don't agree with Standard, what used to be standard model, that they should probably look dimmer than you'd expect. You have to put it by hand, even if you don't know what your dark energy is. These are similar idea with standard candles, so we have some features on the cosmic macro background. That's after you do Fourier transform in the sky, those called spheric harmonics. And also, if you do Fourier transform of the galaxy distribution, there's a feature there which is about 150 megaparsecs, and you can use it to tell the geometry of universe. You measure the angle, you know the physical scale, so you can tell distances in different cosmologies. Uh, these black circles are classes of galaxies. It turns out, whenever a simple thing, people ask someone, what does dark energy do to you? What it does, it gives you more. If you put more dark energy, the, the age of the universe is longer. If you put more dark energy, the volume of the universe is bigger. But the structure grows more slowly. So just by counting how many circles you have of different richness, you can tell if it's universe with or without dark energy. This is a magical method which goes back to Einstein that um, if, if there is a feature in this thing, the distance, say it's, it looks just like a circle. Uh, the galaxy, which is a perfect circle, if there is a mass between us and that circle, 
this circle becomes a banana shape. And that's really quite amazing. It's called rotational lensing. And the clusters is very strong, and you see arcs, and even some of the circle called Einstein ring. In typically, you see arcs like this, and this will lead me in a moment to talk about uh, machine learning. Uh, and in the field, you also have a little bit of distortion, and you can do the inverse problem. You can look at the amount of distortion and tell what's the mass between us and, and that this top. Of course, it's, it's along the whole line of sight. And these are these red and blue regions you see here. So if you've never seen dark matter before, this is dark matter. Or this is what algorithm gave in this chemical. Now, in terms of analysis, a lot has been going on. A lot is going on. Uh, how many in the audience are Bayesians? Wow, that's not bad, but there's uh, still a way to go. You know, in the cosmology conference, probably these days it would be 99 out of 100. Particle physics are still more liberal than those frequencies. When I did my PhD in Cambridge, Bayesian methods were not yet established in astronomy. Now, what you do, you have the observation, say, cosmic micro background, you have a theory. And you do inference, you say the probability for parameters given data, and the model is a probability for the data given um, given the parameters of the model times the probability for the parameters given the model. This is Bayes' rule, uh, and this is now very common. And after you do that, and you have to pay attention to the priors, it's a whole lecture of its own, you can then derive the optimal parameter. So that's what's going on in CMB surveys. And I mentioned uh, the latest results of Planck were just announced this week. You can look at the article. I mentioned weak lensing. This is work by PhD student of mine, Nat Nile Jeffrey. And he's using a method to get this inverse problem, right? To go from the distortion of the distant galaxies to the mass. And he's using this technique, uh, help, which is some kind of should remind you of chi square, but it's more fancy, it looks at sparsity. And this is some penalty function. This lambda, I think, is what people refer to as hyperparameters. I would call it regularization number. Anyway, you can see that this method does better than the other two. Okay, you can identify globes, so again, picture down. Okay, so this was this kind of introduction, but I think it would make it easier for me to explain the rest. So I, I talk about four applications. One is object classification. If you play with scikit, you see in neural nets, you put in input raptors, you have some target number, which is, you could say, is it a star a galaxy, for example, this kind of thing. Uh, here it's for photometric ratio, which I'll talk to about at the moment. Or you can do decision trees that you ask questions about parameters, and you train it to define the boundaries of the parameters. So this is an intuitive way to remind you those things. So I have one student, Mayan. Uh, so Maniac, she looked, this is a dark energy survey, and she, the thing is to tell what's a star, what's a galaxy, right? Simple as that. And you can, of course, extract the magic parameter that will tell you which is which, because the light from the star is more spiky. So that's what a collaborator devised one parameter, and here are the stars, here are the galaxies, but you can see it's not that separable, you still have this phase. You can't tell one from another. So what Mayan has done is to actually use some combination of data compression, like PCA, and then to use neural nets, and you can see that it's much more separable now. That's a simple example. Now, I told you that we employed in the early 90s six gurus to look at um, uh, to look at galaxies and tell us what they are, only 830. And that is became a key. In industry. In fact, Chris Linton, who is now professor in Oxford, who was my student here when I moved to UCL, he, he put a whole system on the on the web. Galaxy Zoo has anyone played with it? Yeah. So it's kind of fun, but I'm a bit critical of them. There are only two classes there, as far as for the But you know, it's nice because it's called citizen science, and they produce lots and lots of results on that. Then we said, could a neural network do it? So the former, this is our work from the 90s, but Amanda Banerjee, who is now in Cambridge, when she was a student, uh, one year we would get using neural nets. So 
Uh, you get a simple you get a the image and you extract parameters in a traditional way and you fit it in the network and you train by eye and that's what you get and you can see the diagonal success rate is 91% to 96% of the person So you know, we, we know that we can do it. Uh, something quite interesting that uh, I really just studied it just as an excuse you know, preparing this talk. Quite interesting, okay, so pay attention to this. So I told you about this, right? I told you, let us go back. I told you about this technique of lensing, right? And you get those arcs. So uh, this is this is actually not an artist's impression. This is really real arcs, okay? So this is there's a cluster of galaxies, which are two of, of the galaxies. I think they call it the smiling face. I want your picture to make it to your times or something, you need to come up with something. It's fine in place. But these are the arcs, okay? So so each of these arcs, or each of these arcs, actually a galaxy far away, far away that gets distorted by the stuff between us, maybe the cluster, and the background. If if there was a perfect symmetry, this would be a whole circle. And there's some systems like this. So the point is that you can you know, the, the standard, the conventional wisdom has been that to detect those arcs, you have to do it by eye. So again, it's a bit like that, it's very time consuming, and maybe you're reducible. Um, but this was the, um, the standard in dark energy survey people done by eye, by the way, my colleague told me, my colleague from Fermanagh told me that uh, they gave it to professional astronomers and high school pupils. To, to try that, and apparently the high school people see much better than professional astronomers because uh, they don't think too much. Okay, they just on that. The astronomers are thinking, what's the name of this cluster, and what's the mass of this cluster. Here, it's just it's just a question about feature finding, right? So, what has happened? It, it's very common. I, I think you well participate in things like that. There are data challenges. So each time you know, there are five, six algorithms on the market. And you go to a conference, and astronomer A says, my method is the best, and then astronomer B says, their method is the best, and so on and so forth. So then people get together to go and say, why don't we do a data challenge? Let's define a data set from simulation of data, where only one or two people know the answer, and we give it to the community, there's a deadline, and people then submit their work. And it's very healthy. It's very healthy. Uh, of course, like any competition, there are winners and losers. That's, that's fine. That's there. It's healthy. Um, so that's what happens. So this is a paper just from February this year, led by Ben Metcalf. Uh, and um, what they've done is about a dozen or so methods. So they start by first they recruited two astronomers, four astronomers who looked at 100,000. Simulate. Okay, they're all simulated, so we know the true answer. And um, those, those uh, astronomers classified the uh, 100,000 and uh, of those objects. And then there were all these different techniques, not necessarily machine learning, all kinds of techniques. But one of those most successful, this is a group from Carnegie Mellon University in, um, in Pittsburgh. Um, so these are the simulations. And here you see mocks with arcs and mocks without arcs. Now, this is very easy. That's an Einstein ring. But here, you know, even if I look at the screen, not so clear. But there's an arc there. But there is a there, or there. So this was the exercise, and they claim they, they were kind of the winners of that competition. And they claim a competence of 90% in that. And I think the, the, there's an interesting sentence in the conclusions that to some of us it came as a surprise that deep learning has done better than human eyes. It's the same conclusion. So, um, now all that is with the view that LSST, which will produce, you know, billions of galaxies, but only one million would be would have those features, right? because you, know, you have to make perfect alignment between your eyes and an intervening galaxy in a distant one. This is only happens like you can do the ratio. 
it's only one million of those. So that's why it's good to do it uh, automatically. Okay, so that's an exciting example. Parameter estimation, so I'm giving you the example of automatic credit. Actually, I, I work with quite a lot. We were among the first to try neural networks for that. So what happens to get the rate if best is to get the spectrum, right? I'm going to be green. Yeah? Spectrum is the best thing. But it's very, it's, as you go to fainter and fainter objects, it's more and more difficult to get spectrum, right? Because the lights get dispersed. So what you do, you do broadband photometry. You put four filters, and that's, for example, what we have done in the server with five, the same idea. And if a galaxy, if the same galaxy is ratio zero, you'll get a certain amount of fluxes in each, in each uh, filter. If the same galaxy is a different redshift, one seven, I assume everyone knows what the redshift is. Okay. Uh, it's then different flux, so it's an inverse problem, right? You get a catalog of four or five numbers per object, and you have to tell, infer the distance of the redshift. So people tried all kinds of technique. It's a very vibrant community, and there are template methods and training methods. Training methods, you have a substance, what you know the to answer. So we push that direction, we develop NNZ, NNZ2, and they are, you can download them and make them publicly available. And there's some other very nice programs. And with Dark Energy Survey, we just try many methods. So this is like the, the true redshift, and that's the photometric one. And you can see lots of scatter, some outliers in particular redshift, and so on. And then you can, of course, someone already said today, the proof of the pudding is in eating. I like the phrase. So that's, that's the proof, because um, you have to do an end-to-end -end analysis and take your catalog with this very uncertain photos and say, do you get the cosmological results? So this is the omega meter, which is believed to be 30%. I'll show you the pie chart. And this is another parameter called sigma 8, which is the level of amplitudes. The, the key point is each of those contours uh, blue, green, and red was done with a different photometric ratio of color. Okay? So again, I try to observe the concept. It's not just asking which algorithm is the best. It's actually a meaningless question. It's which algorithm is the best to achieve a particular science question. Right? Otherwise, you just end up doing metrics. But this metrics should reflect the science you're interested in. And it may well be that two methods are good enough for something, or it could be that one is the nonsense. Changing the scale, this is work by a student, CDT student here at UCL, who is working with uh, Serena Bitti in our group. And that's actually has to do, so direct questions to me. Uh, this is, has to do with, with uh, using data from ALMA, very ambitious uh, result. And that's again, they look at particular wavelengths to identify certain molecules like CO. So, and they basically they have an image, it's a data cube. They have an image in each direction. You also have a few measurements in different wavelengths. And now you want to undo it. And they've done some training, and they want basically to talk about the contribution of the molecules in different regions, right? It's quite nice, it's like a weather map of the galaxy showing the composition. So I, I call it parameter estimation, I think it's possible. Moving to time domain. So what are supernovae? That they come in different forms. The 1A, which are very important for which you know, the discovery of, of uh, dark energy was very much based on that. Well, there's a long history of dark energy. I think you're not actually on that. But there are two teams that look at supernovae, particular type 1A, using the sun like candles, already talked about it, and they got the Nobel Prize in 2011. So obviously, with a big service, you'd like to know which objects are 1A, so you can put them into the cosmology analysis, right? Otherwise, you have contamination. So what, what you get are light curves. I showed you already <coughs> that concept, right? It's light against time, and there's this decline. This is an actual example of a real supernova detected with dark energy survey. 1A usually it's, it's a combination of a star, dwarf star, a pretty mass, then there's an explosion. We don't completely understand it, but there is a light curve. So this was a challenge in, in, in uh, feature extraction. And you can do template fitting. You can do some parameterization like curve. And you can do wavelengths as well. 
And uh, we have done some work here led by Michel Lochner. Um, and this was about you know, taking data and try different feature extractions. So this is not deep learning, OK? In fact, there's a parallel paper in deep learning could conclude the same because the number of data is, is still small, which is the conclusion of that curve we showed you that deep learning is effective with more data. So we should pay attention to it. And then what Michelle has done after doing the feature extraction, which I think is the clever part of this work, uh, she used the scikit learn, uh, five methods, and classified objects uh, on simulations, so you know the true answer. And uh, these are the rock curve, it's a true positive rate versus positive, false positive, uh, see rock curves. So, and you can see the winner here, of course, I love neural nets, but the winner here turned to me, boosted decision trees. If you want to know more about look at the psychic documentation and the paper, it's on the archive and the journal. Uh, this is just a, uh, just to show you, close up that uh, same result. Okay, more on time domain, of course, gravitational waves. So you have the lecture here on Monday. This is quite amazing, this discovery. That's another Nobel Prize. I mean, it's kind of interesting that many of these things are touching Nobel Prizes, right? This type of work. And this is the latest Nobel Prize. By now, seven events have been detected. Six of them are of binary black holes, and one of them is a binary neutron star. And later, we'll probably get a few per week, so it's going to be a huge industry. And this is the strain. I'm not going through the whole story, right? But that's what happens how the, these two blacks collide, and this is black holes collide, and that's what you get. And just know that there's, the info is you know, a, a big fraction of the speed of light. It's, it's really quite amazing. Now, we're very excited because we could actually, these are the seven events, by the way, so far. Um, and we're quite excited. Could you see this animation? Do you see that dot there? So this is a galaxy called NGC 4993, boring elliptical galaxy. And there was a system, it still is, that the, the MIGO people sent alerts. Whenever they suspect something, they send an alert. Uh, and then 70 observatories, if they are valuable, look at it. Uh, around black hole, black hole, you don't expect any radiation, but when it's a binary neutron star, you are expecting that. And um, we're very pleased with dark energy surveys, as well as other six or so surveys. We're very pleased to, to actually see that flash of light coming from the same object. And that gives lots of information. We need some work here with the student of Massey, also with Harty on that, understanding the properties of the galaxy and so on. So this is going to be a huge topic, and there are already papers that talk about how to use uh, machine learning for that. Okay, we'll speed up a bit. I'm nearly there. Uh, another time domain is to, to look for planets, either around the solar system or exoplanets. <laughs> the people who work on that as well. Um, my CDT PG student, Ben Hendricks, is actually working on a search for Planet 9, which is hypothetical. But who knows? Maybe it could be found in the dark necessary data. Who knows? So talk to you about that. He'll tell you some stories about that. That's together with David Gers in Michigan. I'll just only say that the Planet 9 was a so we don't know yet that it exists just in case. I mean, it's hypothetical. But the people who suggested based it on six orbits of objects, and one of them, which I think is that one, was actually by itself detected by dark necessary. So it's kind of fun, and it, you know, it's a server which is designed to do some dark energy on the planet itself. So that's another lesson, is people in, young people in the field don't just do whatever the proposals say, or as your supervisor think, what else can you do with that data? Finally, this is something I am kind of proud of, because I think it's something very different than all the classification and time series and so on. I call it the gravitational dynamics. Um, so I don't know if you're aware of this, and I hope 
you may not do sleep <coughs> overnight after you hear that, but are you aware of it that, well, you, you all don't believe in the Milky Way, right? I'm assuming one of you is on that. And our nearest uh, neighbor, big galaxy, is Andromeda, and they're actually falling towards each other. So while the Earth is expanding, they're falling towards each other, and they're going to collide one day. Yeah, I'm not aware of that. Um, they'll, they'll probably produce an elliptical galaxy one day. In any case, you can do a very simple analysis, which goes back to papers in the 1959, and my late supervisor, Linda Bell, did some work on that, and, and others. Um, uh, you can just write the acceleration very easy, minus g over r squared. We did a paper with student, we added lambda there. You know, the cosmological constant, you think there's a repulsive force in Swan's case. And you can, just by knowing the infall velocity and the distance, you can tell the mass. But we thought, look, it's just a bit too many. Okay, I mean, just to assume this formalism seems to only assume that there's only a Andromeda Milky Way in the universe and the rest is just uh, kind of uniform. Uh, it's more complicated. So we decided to actually use, and this is why we work led by Michael McLeod, who just defended his thesis on Monday. So he's still around. Uh, what we tried to do is we said maybe the physics is incomplete. Let's the, the machine learn physics from the simulations. So if you like, we've done the feature extraction local. What is it the dense region? What are the tidal forces around? And so on. And actually, what we find is that the results, you know, if, if I just do it very naively, uh, by a simple algorithm, I get those dashed lines. But if I do it with a neural network and add, especially this parameter, which is the local shear around this object. So just to explain, we, we did simulations and we pick up 30,000 lookalike pairs of Andromeda with a lookalike. And we say, let's teach the algorithm based on all those parameters in the environment. And what you see is, although the mean is about the same, which is reassuring, that main model hypothesized in 1959, only that part, they didn't know about lambda, is actually pretty good. But sometimes you make a bold assumption, it's quite good. But we can reduce the scattering. So to me, it's an interesting idea that you can kind of use information simulation, you can write analytically, to improve the number. So, I'm nearly there. I mean, you are in a very special time in the history of the universe, the first CBT ever, summer school, etc. And But it, there's still a revolution, if you like, to read the more exciting stuff. There's a book by a cosmologist called Max Sternmark, and he talks about life version 3. So life version 1 is just biological, like bacteria or something, which could survive and replicate itself, right? But this poor creature could not write software. It didn't get to use TensorFlow, for example. Tough, you know? But then came live version 2, which is us and another 7 billion people, and that can survive, can replicate itself, and can design software, right? Uh, but uh, Tegman speculates will be a third one, which is uh, because of technological, where not only you can do that, but actually, if you like, robots will design robots. Okay, and that's where it's getting very scary. And you might have seen a petition against a killer robot, signed by Bill Gates, uh, that day, and then thousands of other people. So, you know, it's an interesting period, and I have to say, I, I'm, although I'm very pleased, this is kind of before closing, before closing remarks, while I'm very pleased, you know, I got into this really being on the fringes something like 25 years ago, and I'm very pleased to see all this activity, but there are also worries, okay, about the reliability. In astronomy, if you say it's elliptical or spiral, you got it wrong. Nobody dies, okay? The reputation suffers, but nothing else. But you know, at what stage would you be able to go, you know, to have an automated medical doctor uh, 
where you, and you don't quite know what they put in the algorithm. You don't quite know if the training set is faithful. I haven't touched on that point. But one big limitation is if, if you use supervised learning, if your training set is not quite robust, or it misses objects, right? We, we showed earlier, they showed us this device that classifies traffic. And I asked them over lunch, you know, what's the training, right? Because what if you didn't, what if you don't train it on motorbikes? How would you know this motorbike, right? Would it? So think about analogy in medicine, right? And, and I think this whole issue of supplementing data set with extra data, could be mock data or other data, is very important for augmentation. So I think there are challenges. So I'll, I'll close, this is my last slide. I think we're going through this industrial revolution. You are part of that. Uh, I, I emphasize both special and time domain, but in many ways they're related. It's not so different, really. I think, to me, there are challenges. No, of course, one can just download scikit learn and tell you results, and that's fine. But I think, for PhD, you know, it's more thinking. And it seems to me understanding features, right? like understanding what the deep learning actually does, or what, how is it related to features that you extract yourself in more intuitive way, to me is very interesting. And the other thing is how to deal with incomplete training sets, because this could easily shift your results. Uh, and then I think it's a great training for PhDs beyond academia, so I don't need to push for that. But with all the transferable skills, and I know the companies and I very appreciate, it. really enjoy, and they enjoy supervising the projects here and through the through in the other cities. I like to be on, you know, like a bit, a bit uh, kind of philosophical about it. Will big data produce better knowledge? We don't know. Is big data going to produce an alternative to general activity? I don't know. And, you know, part of it is just in nature and also how smart the physics are, uh, so I just encourage not to stop thinking, because you're just putting something into a black box and it's not as dense, right? But I think it could help to explore things, discover new objects, and maybe lead eventually to new physics, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, we've got, I think we've got until 5.30, which is 5 minutes, so if people are there any questions? Maybe to, to answer. <coughs> no. Okay. Well, I think we should let you enjoy the fresh air, and uh, we'll see you at the poster session. Seven o'clock.